I'm the director of this new school academic unit at Arizona State University School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership. And we welcome you to the second day of this conference on free speech and intellectual diversity in higher education and American society. Uh, for those who attended the first day of the conference, um, uh, I heard from many people it was a real treat, an intellectual feast. Um, mostly, I would characterize it on the philosophical or more theoretical side of these important but difficult questions. And today we have three panels um, that are still discussing theoretical and general questions, but we also do turn to some more specific scenarios and specific situations regarding uh, free speech on campus and, and intellectual diversity on university campuses, college campuses. Uh, I hope everybody has a program. If you don't have a program, they're, they're sort of on the other side of the bridge um, with the materials on the school. Quite a few uh, important pieces of information in this booklet about the school. I won't rehearse all the things that are in there, uh, but the front half of the program is mostly about uh, this conference and, and the speakers and the schedule. And the second half of the program has more information about the school um, itself. Um, so we begin today with um, a distinguished set of people talking about um, uh, maybe the, the focal point or flashpoint uh, which got us thinking about um, this set of lectures and dialogue events across the whole year in the series and then this, this uh, two-day conference. Um, we have to moderate this panel, someone who brings together uh, practical experience as a university administrator and academic leader on the one hand and her scholarly theoretical experience as a lawyer and professor of political science. So we're grateful to have her uh, moderating the panel. We're also grateful to have Stephanie Lindquist, who's the deputy provost of Arizona State University, as a member of the planning committee for this entire uh, series of, of uh, lectures and dialogue events in this conference. So to just give a brief introduction of Stephanie, she is uh, the deputy provost uh, of the university and also a foundation professor of law and political science here at ASU. And in all her spare time, she's also teaching constitutional law this semester at the law school. Uh, she came to us from the University of Georgia at Athens, where she was the dean and professor at the School of Public and International Affairs. She also had held several positions, uh, administrative dean positions at the University of Texas School of Law, and before that had taught at Vanderbilt. Her teaching and scholarship focus on constitutional law, the Supreme Court, administrative law, and empirical legal studies. And her blend of professional uh, experience and academic experience also includes serving as a clerk for the Honorable Anthony J. Sirica at the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit in Philadelphia, and also having served as a research associate at the Federal Judicial Center in Washington, D.C. Please join me in welcoming our panel and Stephanie Lynch. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law and to the Buse Center for Law and Society. Um, I hope you enjoy the building. This is a new building we're very excited about. Uh, this is uh, just the second year that we've been in this building, so, uh, so welcome. Uh, I'm sorry that Sandra Day O'Connor can't be here. I think Justice O'Connor would find this conference very uh, important and, and uh, in, in, consistent with her interest in civic engagement, so, so welcome. Very excited this morning to be able to moderate this panel on negotiating controversial speakers on campus. And we have with us this morning three uh, very uh, interesting and uh, experienced scholars in this area. So at the end of the, let me introduce the speakers this morning. At the end of our uh, table here, we have Dr. Ulrich Baer. He is a uh, professor of German and comparative literature in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at New York University. He holds a PhD for, from Yale, and he is an expert in modern poetry, literary theory, and philosophy. He is the recipient of numerous fellowships and awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, uh, a, a Getty Fellowship, and an Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship. Uh, and he has uh, written an interesting editorial in the New York Times, uh, which is encouraging us to take students' concerns about free speech very seriously. So welcome to Dr. Baer. To his right, 
is uh, Heather McDonald. She is the Thomas W. Smith Fellow at the Manhattan Institute in New York. Uh, she is a commentator and essayist, essayist on uh, matters and uh, political and social issues. And she has written, written widely on a number of topics, including immigration reform, welfare reform, racism and racial profiling, philanthropy, and academia. She holds the law degree from Stanford Law School. She is a contributing editor to New York City Journal. And she has had a recent experience at McKenna, uh, Claremont McKenna College involving a speech she was going to give about Black Lives Matter. And so I'll let her tell us a little bit about that when she speaks. And finally, to my immediate left is Dr. Brett Weinstein. He holds the PhD from the University of Michigan in biology. And until recently, he taught biology at Evergreen College until a series of events catalyzed by the university's day of absence and day of presence uh, prompted Professor Weinstein to, to uh, write a spirited response uh, to a request that he leave the campus based on race. And so I'll again let him tell us a little bit about that when he speaks. Now, the, uh, the format of the panel, we will hear from each panelist, and I've asked them to speak for about 10 or 12 minutes about their experiences and perspectives. And then uh, I may ask a few questions, but I'm very eager for the audience to ask questions as well and engage in a conversation about these important issues on campus. Um, and I think there's probably going to be a microphone set up for questions. So perfect, it's in the back of the room. So I'm going to start, I think, immediately to my left with Professor Weinstein, and I will turn the podium over to you. Thank you. Uh, are you guys able to hear? Good. So I, uh, I don't often suffer from imposter syndrome, but on this panel, I, I do feel a little bit like an imposter. I've never been a college administrator, so as for how we should deal with controversial speakers on campus, I really couldn't tell you. Were we to have a panel on how to become a controversial speaker, I would have <laughs> quite a few things to say on the matter. Um, so yes, I have become a controversial speaker, which is an interesting tale. I know from experience that in a room like this, many people will be well familiar with what happened to me, and many others will never have heard anything about it. And that, I believe, is an indicator about some things that uh, fall under the heading of filter bubbles that we should be very aware of. Our narratives have broken apart, which is something that I will get to later in my remarks. Mostly, I would like to keep this sparse so that we can have more time for interaction in the question and answer. I have the sense that, especially this late in a conference like this, that there's a lot to be gained by interacting. So I will uh, get to some, some points and then hand over the, uh, the spotlight here. So I became controversial, and I would argue that really there's not very much that should have made me controversial. And really what happened is that I'm a biologist, which means that I believe certain things which most of my colleagues would say are completely uncontroversial, but are out of step with the public narrative. So I believe, for example, that there are differences between the sexes that owe to evolutionary history and that um, they have implications for us in the present. I don't think that's a normative statement. I don't believe we are obligated to hold to anything that evolution has handed us, but in some cases we have more flexibility than others. So that viewpoint has made me um, out of step with a political movement that has uh, become ascendant. Uh, I'm also uh, moderately persuasive and diplomatic, and that made me a problem on my campus because when people advanced a particular agenda, I would typically stand up and tell them, actually, that's a bad idea and here's why. And so in the end, that resulted in a witch hunt in which my wife and I were actually forced to resign our positions. Now, I say witch hunt, and that sounds inflammatory, but the interesting thing is this is one of those things that the people who protested and my wife and I agree on. They portrayed it as a witch hunt to each other prior to its occurring, and we regarded it as a witch hunt, and I only discovered months later that they had portrayed it that way themselves. So it was a witch hunt, and it did succeed, and that is an important fact uh, in considering situations like mine. So I've been in many discussions about free speech since this episode occurred. People are constantly inviting me to these things because the episode is taken to be 
uh, an important event in that discussion. And I always make the same point, which is that actually what happened at Evergreen and other colleges that have had similar events has very little to do with free speech in any traditional sense. It's actually the wrong framework um, to look at it with. That said, it's relevant because the only tools that we have to fend off this perspective come to us through that modality. In other words, the Founding Fathers handed us some tools under the label of free speech, and every so often they overlap one of these things in a way that they provide some sort of a defense, which is why we end up on this topic. But I would encourage us to free ourselves from that framing and look at what's taking place from uh, an alternative perspective. So, on to the points. My first point would be that we are discussing the wrong question, and we are rather, in, in this conference, uh, like a doctor who has an anemic patient. Right? The patient comes to us, they have anemia, and we are very focused on dealing with their anemia. But actually, the patient is sick with leukemia, and we haven't realized it yet. So we are, we are obsessed with trying to raise the iron levels in their blood, but even if we manage to raise the iron levels in the blood, it's not going to save them. We have to figure out they have leukemia first. And so uh, I would like to try to frame the question in such a way that we can see uh, both why we are uh, standing in the wrong place to see it correctly and what a right place might look like. But I should say, um, of all of the discussions on free speech that I've been involved in in the last uh, nine months, this is by far the closest to getting the right framing, and that is in large measure due to the way Robert Post introduced us to the topic. His point about the way colleges have to depart from a rigorous free speech standard, that their purpose requires them to be highly selective about speech, is correct. Now, there are other reasons um, that we should be skeptical of a free speech framework, but I believe he, he set the conference in motion in exactly the right way. I would point out that free speech is also largely irrelevant because it is so arbitrary as to where it applies. Evergreen happens to be a state school, and that means that free speech in a First Amendment sense happens to be relevant as far as things that go on on Evergreen's campus that involve the participation of the administrators. Reed College, which is only 120 miles south of Olympia, happens to be private. Right? So that means those same protections don't apply. There's no reason that that should matter to us in this room. The role that Reed College and Evergreen College play in civilization is parallel. There's no, the fact that the, the governmental protections apply to one and not the other is an accident of history. It is not meaningful. Even worse, if we were to compare Evergreen, let's say, to Harvard. Harvard is a private institution. The First Amendment does not apply in the same way. Evergreen is a public institution. The First Amendment applies. But Evergreen is actually, in many ways, more private than Harvard. Harvard is fueled by money from the NIH and NSF. Evergreen is not. Evergreen is fueled by tuition dollars, which are private. So the fact of the overlap between First Amendment protections and some institutions really couldn't be less meaningful. So we should at least step back far enough to say that what we really are talking about is a question of freedom of expression and academic freedom, and that those things um, are not constitutional protections. They are more like traditions and values that I believe all reasonable people would share. But nonetheless, the legal protections are not the right framework to approach this. Now, here's where this is going to get troubling. I want to go one step farther than where Robert Post took us. I want to argue this isn't even really about the academy. The academy is the first battle in a conflict that we have yet to understand, a conflict that is going to be much larger than the academy. And I would argue, and I know that this is going to be inflammatory given the number of academics in the room, but my sense is that if this could be limited to the academy, that would actually be a victory. This does jeopardize the ability of the academy to continue to play its role in civilization. And it does plausibly render that institution non-viable if we are unable to corral it. But if all we lost to this battle was the academy, I would say that's a victory. The academy can be rebuilt, and it's possible that if we rebuilt the academy now, understanding what's wrong with the legacy structure that we have, we could rebuild it in a way that would be um, more functional and more appropriate to the 21st century. So 
Um, I know we don't want to think about the academy as potentially expendable, but what we are facing is so much more dangerous that I think we have to start thinking in those terms. I am expecting some pushback on that point, and I'm looking forward to it in the Q&A. So what do I mean? How could this possibly be bigger than the academy? Well, let's look at the battle where it has spilled over into another entity visibly, Google. So most of you have probably become aware of James Damore and his famous memo. I have now met James Damore uh, and talked with him extensively about it. I would encourage you, if you have not read it, to read the memo that he wrote. Don't read an edited version. Read his version and read it entirely. And then compare it to the portrayal of James Damore in the press. He is portrayed as a misogynistic monster. There is no evidence of this in his memo. And what's more, when one meets him, that portrayal cannot be reconciled with the person that one encounters. James Damore is a thoroughly decent, gentle guy. He is not interested in advancing the cause of men at the expense of women. It's the farthest thing from his mind, and he says so in his memo. He offers suggestions to address the very problem that he was responding into the memo. One of the problem which he was asked to respond to by his employer. They put him through diversity training and they asked for his input and his memo was a response to that request. So Google has a problem. Google fired James Damore for writing a memo they asked him to write and a memo that is actually scientifically quite responsible and more or less uncontroversial. It is, however, very controversial out in civilization, and that tells us something. Well, why is this a problem? It's a problem because it suggests that Google has a naive and deeply political perspective at odds with basic science. And that's a tremendous problem for us because of what Google is. Google, I will argue, is actually part of a de facto governance apparatus for civilization that we did not elect or choose. It simply evolved. And that thing has control over what conversations we can have. It has control over which voices are amplified, which ones are unhearable. And it also has um, a uh, conflict of interest based on the fact that it is a for-profit entity. So more on that shortly. My second point would be that evolution is haunting many of our structures that we are facing and we don't realize it. There are four characteristics that are necessary and sufficient to build a system that will generate adaptive evolution. We keep building these systems. We build them with certain intentions and then they evolve out from under those intentions and they do their own thing because that's what evolution is about. And the founding fathers have an excuse. They built an evolutionary system without um, building the proper protections into it because nobody had talked about evolution yet, so they didn't recognize that that was a possibility. We don't have that defense. We now know about evolution, and we understand what causes it to happen. And when we build a system in the market or in our political structure, and we imbue it with the characteristics that cause adaptive evolution, we should expect it to evolve. And what it will do when it evolves is it will discover the um, the geometry of the niche space. It will discover what the opportunities are, irrespective of what we would like it to do. And so that is a bit, that, that's what we are facing. Google is now discovering its niche, and it is becoming the entity that is most fit for that niche. It's not the entity that its creators wanted. It's not the one that we as consumers want. It is just something that we have to, to grapple with. Now let's think a little bit about what this new governance apparatus is. Well, it's supranational, right? It's bigger than a nation. Google does not stop at anybody's borders. Um, it is unaccountable. We don't know what goes on inside of Google because it's a private concern and nobody has the right to look through uh, its discussions and documentation. It is omnipotent. Now, this is very frightening. What Google knows about you is absolutely terrifying, and should it, Google decide that it does not want your perspective to advance, those facts that it knows about you could become relevant. You wouldn't necessarily know where they had come from, but the fact is it knows an awful lot. It's also omnipresent, so it begins to have characteristics of a governance structure and some kind of uh, deity. And as I mentioned before, it's conflicted. It's a for-profit corporation. It has... Uh, 
fiscal responsibilities that are not consistent with it being um, a proper governance apparatus. So we have to deal with Google, and I don't mean to single it out. Google is what I'm mentioning because of the DeMore memo, but we have similar problems with Twitter, with Facebook, with Patreon, all of these private concerns that are in a position to dictate whose voices get heard by whom. My third point would be that there is a, an element that is missing from virtually every discussion when we talk about human beings and how they function and how we should think about our interaction. The missing element is development. Where you grow up, in what circumstances, and what you encounter dictates what you will be as an adult, what kinds of tools you have at your disposal, what sorts of blind spots you will have, what, what understanding of the, the universe you will carry with you. And those developmental facts have a, uh, a distinct implication for the functioning of entities like the academy. So when our students show up in the academy, they bring with them the product of their developmental environment. The fact that they don't play outside anymore in the way that people once did may seem like a small fact, right, or an aesthetic fact, but it's not because what happens to you outside is an environment that cannot be fooled, right? You can have wrong notions about gravity, but you'll quickly learn about them through skinned knees. And so that feedback tells you things about the way the universe actually does work. If you substitute for that an online education in the way the world works, you may not learn so much about gravity, and when you actually encounter a physical system, you may misunderstand it. I mean, genuinely misunderstand it. Second thing, not only do they not play outside anymore, but they are effectively being raised by a market. They are constantly encountering people who wish to part them from their money and con them, and this creates um, both a susceptibility to certain kinds of pitches and a resistance to other kinds of pitches. And those things are very important when we face these folks in the classroom. Just a couple more minutes. Just two more minutes? Okay. Um, so let me skip ahead then a little bit. Um, the developmental environment that, that millennials have faced is effectively anarchic. And I mean that not in a derisive sense. I actually mean it in the most honorable sense. So anarchy, in the proper sense, is a basically self-erecting system, a structure in which people self-organize and police themselves. It is preposterous to imagine that this is ever going to work in a large group. And the reasons that it doesn't work are painfully obvious. It just simply doesn't scale up. But in a small group, it does function reasonably well. And so millennials, in particular, have lived in online environments before they ever get to college where they police things like trolling within a discussion. So when somebody enters a discussion on evolutionary biology, let's say, and they promote the perspective that all of us folks talking about evolution in classical terms are uh, part of some sort of a conspiracy against the truth which involves triple-stranded DNA or something like that, that is capable of shutting down the conversation. And what happens is people figure out how to shut down the troll so we can get back to talking about the thing in question. Now, I would argue that what happens to controversial speakers on these campuses is that they are shut down by this anti-troll mechanism where it is not appropriately applied. They should listen to speakers with whom they don't agree because they're there in that environment for a different reason. Um, but their reflexive anti-troll response is what they know. It's what they have learned in the real school that prepared them for college. And so they don't understand that they're misapplying it. I don't know how to make that point to them, but I do think it's important that we recognize that it's happening. <laughs> and my last point would be that our narratives are now incoherent. That it used to be that civilization shared certain narratives. They weren't all true, but at least they brought us together because we all understood the same basic story of what took place. The New York Times used to be the paper of record, and whether what was in it was true or false, at least we all shared that, share, that, uh, that narrative. And the absence of a shared narrative is extremely dangerous in a civilization. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Weinstein. Turn well, the podium over to Heather. Yes, yes and it's a, it's a privilege to be here at this conference, and I thank ASU and, uh, for organizing it. And I, I want to follow up uh, on some of the comments that Professor Weinstein made in order to reemphasize the fact that what we're seeing happening in the academy now with regards to uh, the effort to silence nonconforming views is not staying put. It is absolutely 
coming out into the real world and transforming uh, both the public sphere and and the private sphere. And of course, the Google Daymore narrative is a is a quintessential part of that. And I want to take it one step further, just to repeat. Uh, Daymore wrote a memo that said that contrary to the absolutely almost religious belief on the part of Silicon Valley companies that the absence of 50-50 gender proportionality in, in STEM environments is due to Google's own bias. It's a very bizarre situation. You have these companies saying, well, we're discriminating. We'll name some names. You know, who are, who are the Google uh, managers who are so benighted that they are unable to spot qualified female talent. But that is the narrative that they are committed to. And James Damore wrote a, a memo that said, that may not be the full story. Uh, if you look at the science of biological sex differences when it comes to different psychological dispositions, whether it's comp competition, appetite for risk, a uh, inclination to work in abstract areas as opposed to people, relational activities. There are differences between males and females that might help explain why we do not see a 50-50 gender uh, proportionality in the STEM fields. He cited science. He made it very clear that he was not speaking about the individual females at Google. He was speaking about averages. He was not talking about the females at Google and saying that they are not competent. He is saying, why aren't there more females at Google? He emphasized he's talking about the distribution of particular inclinations uh, towards the world. So as we know, that got him fired. And the interesting thing about how he was fired is that the Google CEO mimicked the maudlin academic language of victimology. He said, employees are hurting. You have advanced harmful stereotypes. Well, unfortunately, the story didn't end there. Last week uh, was released a memo, an advice memo, written by a regional board of the NLR, NLRB. In, dis in August, when Daymore was fired from Google, he filed a complaint with the NLRB claiming that this was a unjust retaliation. He then, Daymore, withdrew his NLRB complaint in January when he filed a state court lawsuit. So that the issue was no longer before the NLRB. Nevertheless, the Associate General Counsel released her advice memo. And this is what should worry us most of all. She adopted the identical victimology rhetoric that the Google CEO had himself appropriated from the academy. And he said that Google was right to fire Daymore because he is involved in discrimination and sexual harassment for this memo, for talking about the science of biological, psychological differences. Now, it doesn't take much imagination to play out the implications of this ruling. This means that anybody like Professor Weinstein in the academy now, say hey, uh, Joanna Molenstrom, an economist who works on competition, and she has found that the different inclination for competition exists in every society, hunter-gatherers or advanced capitalism between men and women, she now could be fired for advancing a harmful, she's involved in sexual harassment and discrimination. So we have come to this point that scientific truth is no defense if it conflicts with feminist received wisdom about the absolute absence of any kind of innate biological differences. So this is spreading. I want to take one more little sounding of our current world back to the academy to see where we're standing now in student discourse and student thought about 
our legacy of civilization. This was at UC San Diego. There was a petition you may have read about, a 23-year-old theater, ma uh, 23 theater major circulated a petition that gained 15,000 signatories uh, to ban a class in Woody Allen's films. And she was asked, well, you know, does this pose any sort of First Amendment problems? Her response was, the First Amendment wasn't relevant because, quote, it was written by a bunch of white men. It was written in the 1700s, the late 1700s. I mean, those men were experiencing things that are completely different now. It's outdated, end quote. Now, where would this student have gotten the idea that she is making a valid argument in pointing out the gender and race of the drafters of the First Amendment? Is this some sort of juvenile idea that just she came up with? No. This is what she has been taught, certainly in college and probably long before that. Students are being justified in their ignorance. Now, this demonstrated ignorance of the role of free speech in a free society is stunning and tells us yet again that our educational system is failing miserably. These self-righteous censors claim that free speech is a weapon to further oppress minorities. The extent of their historical ignorance and contemporary ignorance is extraordinary. In 1860, Frederick Douglass was going to participate in a gathering in a church in Boston to commemorate the one-year anniversary of the death of the abolition, radical abolitionist James John, uh, John Brown. And the newspapers in the North had been calling for the silencing of abolitionist speech. And a mob stormed this gathering and prevented Douglas from speaking. A few days later, he wrote an impassioned broadside called a, a Call for Free Speech in Boston. And he said, slavery cannot tolerate free speech. Five years of its exercise would banish the auction block and break every chain in the South. Liberty is meaningless where the right to utter one's thoughts and opinions has ceased to exist. That of all rights is the dread of tyrants. It is the right which they first of all strike down. Now these student censors that have censored Professor Weinstein, that have censored me, they claim that they have nothing but contempt for the Enlightenment legacy, and they think that free speech is a tool of oppression. But however serious this free speech threat is, it's merely a symptom. It's an epiphenomenon of what I think is a far more serious problem, which is the embrace in the academy of victimology. Censorship is the natural and inevitable result of the paramount mission of today's university, assigning guilt and innocence within the ruthlessly competitive hierarchy of victimhood. Almost the entire university has been overtaken by a single idea, that to be a minority, a female, or one of ever multiplying varieties of non-binary genders in America is to be the target of endless, life-threatening bigotry. That bigotry is particularly acute, we are to believe, on college campuses. Minority and female students are being taught to believe that they are quite literally under existential threat. At Brown University, minority students met with the provost to complain that they should not have to meet traditional academic expectations, going to class, getting your homework in on time, taking exams, because they said, quote, we have to focus on staying alive on this campus. Such maudlin expressions of self-pity are now encouraged and rewarded. You may recall the Black Lives Matter protests that took over campuses in the fall of 2015. My favorite moment from those protests occurred at Princeton, where a group of black students said, we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Now, this was a phrase first used by Fannie Lou Hammer. 
Fannie Lou Hamer was a civil rights activist who was beaten in the 1950s for trying to vote. She grew up on a Mississippi cotton plantation, the son of sharecroppers. Fannie Lou Hamer had grounds to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. But any Princeton student, I don't care if he's green, purple, or orange, who thinks of himself as a victim is operating under a crippling delusion. He is the most privileged human being in human history. And yet, the Princeton faculty and administration encourage these students in this completely fantastical self-image. So as long as this ideology of victimology remains the dominant narrative, the movement to suppress ideas that challenge it will remain overpowering because students are engaging in the following equation that free speech is harmful, I'm a victim, it puts me at lethal risk and therefore should be suppressed. Faculty can write all the petitions they want saying free speech is important and it's as surprising how few there are of such petitions, but we've seen them at Chicago and elsewhere, Princeton. They're not gonna make a darn bit of difference if this victimology narrative remains dominant. What has to happen is the next time Students demand various forms of reparations for their oppression, whether the firing of a faculty member or an administrator, a new racially segregated dorm, more mandated identity politics in the curriculum. Here's what their college president should say. Are you kidding me? You're the most privileged individuals in human history. You have at your fingertips the thing that Faust sold his soul for, knowledge. You can read every book that's ever been written. You have scientific laboratories, the opportunity to learn languages, study history. Everything is open to you. Not only is this not a racist environment, every faculty member on this campus wants all of his students to succeed. We are tolerant, we are compassionate. Your fellow students just want to get along make a few friends, do as little studying as possible in order to get a degree, and get out of there and get a job. But a college president, of course, says none of these things. At every outbreak of student narcissism, he kowtows, engages in the same maudlin rhetoric, makes amends, apologizes, says, we'll give you another 10 to $15 million in diversity bureaucracy. This carefully cultivated chip on students' shoulders is gonna haunt them for the rest of their lives, preventing their ability to seize opportunities. So it becomes imperative to rebut the victimology narrative. It is not enough to call for freedom of expression. That is, if I may borrow a term, a relatively safe space to take. Even some liberals, as we see, will back you up on that. Know if we're gonna restore civil harmony and avoid further civil unrest and splintering of the cohesion of the society, we're gonna to have to take on that victimology narrative straight on and assert that racism and oppression are not the predominant characteristics of American society and colleges today. For all our undoubted flaws, there has never been a more tolerant, opportunity-filled polity than our own. And if we want to preserve our freedom to debate matters in legitimate, that are in legitimate dispute, we're going to need to speak the truth about things that should be of common agreement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. So first of all, thank you to ASU for inviting me and to um, everybody for showing up this morning, 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning. I appreciate especially students coming over. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to Carol McNamara and Paul Carries for inviting me. Um, it's really an honor to be among so many distinguished speakers and people I've learned from greatly in the past. I'm speaking my capacity as a, a university professor. I've been teaching for 21 years at New York University. I've been teaching freshmen without interruption for 17 years every fall, and in the spring I teach a different class. So it's just, a lot of this is based on my experience of actually listening to students and not just condemning them 
or dismissing them entirely. Um, and I am also a vice provost at the university. I do not speak in that capacity, so I'm not recommending any policies that NYU would adopt, but I'm certainly drawing on my experiences and having been engaged and involved in many of these very, very difficult issues. And I think they deserve a bit more nuance, perhaps, and I think what's been missing for me a little bit in the last two days is the side of the students who actually have, I think, articulated, sometimes well, sometimes less well, that there is something not quite right working in the institution of the university for some of them. They have tried to bring this to the attention of faculty. My role as a faculty member, I've always thought, was to listen to that. When something isn't working well in my classroom or in my university, and I'm responsible for large parts of the largest private university in America, then I would think something may not be quite right, and I may just want to check myself first to say I know what's wrong, which is, for example, that you don't know your First Amendment. As Robert Post explained to us yesterday, that is maybe not quite the right response because it doesn't apply exactly in the academic context the way people think. And maybe my other attitude should not be to say, you're just inherently wrong because you're young, uninformed, full of passion, driven by passion rather than argument or reason. So I thought it would be listening. I'm also, um, it's probably perhaps welcoming what Heather is identifying, that the model in victimology is alive and well on all sides of the political spectrum. I think we've heard from Professor Hayward on that there's a lot of victim crying on all sides. Conservative faculty feel besieged, under attack, have to hide, cannot out themselves. So this language is on all sides. I think Heather's own um, stance is one of being a kind of victim of a kind of oppression. So I, don't, I think this distributes evenly across the political spectrum. I want to make an exemption, though, for Alison Stanger and what Brett experienced. That should not happen to anyone, and I want to really acknowledge that. That experience is intolerable and shouldn't happen to anyone. So I don't want to make simple equations here between people who say they have been victimized and people who have actually suffered real serious consequences. I just want to make that clear. That is actually also my starting point with talking about and with the students. So. The Jews will not replace us. The Jews will not replace us. Whose streets, our streets. Whose streets, our streets. That was the academic argument brought by Richard Spencer and his troops to the University of Virginia campus in Charlottesville under the mantle of free speech protection that we must invite someone like that. We must invite someone like that was the argument the entire summer by the ACLU the New Republic, the Atlantic Monthly, New York Magazine, every single person across the political spectrum basically said, as Americans, we have the stomach, the vigor, the kind of smartness and the kind of Republican commitments to endure this vile speech. We can deal with that. We can allow someone to come to our campus and scream and say, the Jews will not replace us. They can carry torches, they can carry bats, they may have concealed weapons, not on this campus here. Actually, I saw a sign that says Second Amendment doesn't apply here outside of the door. You cannot bring your weapon into this room, so that's really an interesting thing. But you can bring a Nazi. You actually must bring a Nazi. And I'll give you some reasons why we should invite the neo-Nazis to campus, like a person like Spencer, who I won't name again. So one of the reasons would be because the truth will always win out, right? We've heard this in the last two days, so I'll be very quick. The truth will win out because we have to refute this argument. We have to debate with these people and sunlight, as Justice Brandeis had said in a Harper's Magazine article 1915, sunlight is the best of disinfectants. Let's get these ideas out into the open. Let's debate them, otherwise they'll fester underground, which is the internet, really, where they're alive and well, I can assure you. Secondly, the other argument made yesterday by Gabriel and, um, I'm sorry, uh, Zachary, Matthew, the student panel, really interesting, some of the students are here today. This makes us a bit stronger. We should be subjected to this kind of thing in college. We shouldn't be in safe spaces, coddled, protected, and ensured that nothing will ever happen to us. But college should prepare us for the real world because it'll actually be kind of what Professor Hayward thought, kind of building up our immune system as it were. So subjecting ourselves to severe racism will make us stronger to withstand it in the real world. I would sort of put a caveat in there. The university is actually not supposed to be the real world. It is actually supposed to be something a little bit distinct. And it is actually supposed to allow for the equal participation of everybody in the educational enterprise. And this will be my argument that the word that has been missing, I think, for the last two days is the word equality which is the, actually the, requ the requisite and the kind of important consideration. Without equality for everyone, free speech is rather meaningless. If free speech is only granted to some people, not to everyone, it is rather meaningless. The third argument is if we don't let someone like the neo-Nazis come to campus, and I'm choosing an extreme example, 
then there's a slippery slope. If we don't allow them, then we will lose all of our rights. Slippery slope argument, which Floyd Abrams, Nadine Strawson, a lot of First Amendment lawyers have made, and say, well, if we you know, make a little tiny um, sort of dent in the First Amendment here, soon your own speech will be prohibited, especially kind of speech of dissent. And this is really important. So Jim Weinstein yesterday, we talked about this sort of that there is, dissent is actually what's supposed to be protected by the First Amendment, dissent against the government. I think the slippery slope is a really interesting argument. I also have found no evidence that prohibiting speech anywhere has led to what people fear. And I'll give you a really succinct and sort of foreshortened kind of argument here. Americans fear that if you restrict speech, this will lead to fascism. Other democracies fear if you allow all speech, this will lead to fascism. So that's really interesting. There is no proof, though. You cannot do that historically say, well, look at France, Argentina, Germany, the UK, Portugal, Brazil, India. They've restricted some speech, and guess where they ended up? In fascism. You also cannot say that in this country, because we allow so much speech, we prevented fascism. This argument, you can't make them. Is that it wasn't because the First Amendment, we didn't end up there. But it is always used to say the slippery slope, want to restrict a little bit, you'll give up all your rights. I actually think it comes from the Bible, James 2.10, whoever keeps the entire law but stumbles or slips in one point is guilty of breaking it all. That's the Bible for you, that is slippery slope. God says if you break one tiny piece of my law, you're breaking it all. I actually think it's a matter of faith, just like I think it's a really important thing to, to note that when Floyd Abrams, Nadine Strassen say it's American to have robust speech protection, and why is it there? Because it's American. I think the circular logic is really important and interesting. It's a foundational dimension of our society. Why is that the case? Because Americans believe, rightly, in a pluralistic society, everybody should have the right to voice their opinion. In a university, this seems especially important that all viewpoints are here, exposed, as I said, truth will win out. So, here you have a kind of slight division here, I would think, between roughly speaking liberals and progressives who think the truth will win out, progress is inevitable, the arc of history is bent toward justice. If you just get this stuff out, ultimately people will see reason and be better off. Like Heather says, ultimately, if we identify the problem here, we will realize that victim ideology is really bad and we'll be in a much better place. And Google will be a better company and people will be, and we will move to a, toward a country where true equality is established, because I assume that is the goal that we all share here. Conservatives don't really have this belief as much, but they believe in something which we can trace, and this is really too quick, but I don't have that much time, sort of to Madison, Federalist Papers 55, where it says Americans have a capacity for self-governance in this particular aspect. They're ultimately, in a pluralistic society, there's going to be a preponderance of people who are good rather than evil. And ultimately, in this country, we will ultimately elect people, and we will ultimately side with our better angels. Um, and this argument is made that, so therefore, Americans have this particular propensity to tolerate and endure all this speech because they can kind of regulate their worst own impulses. So that is tracing back to Federalist Papers. So let's say in a university you are faced with the situation of having to bring somebody in. Could you draw a line ever? And I've been asked this question in many ways and formats, in friendly and not so friendly ways. Who are you to draw the line? Well, I'm a university administrator. Many of you academics, first of all, I would say everybody is drawing a line all the time. As we heard yesterday in Robert Post's presentation, academics are in the business of drawing lines, of what merits debate, that some ideas have been settled. They don't get renegotiated. They are what Thomas Kuhn considered paradigms. Of course, within a discipline, there's always challenges. People will reinvestigate, reexamine, evolution came along, as Brett said, and so new ways of thinking about things are there, but some things are just settled for good. And so I'll hone in and I'll close with that on one idea that I don't think merits debate, which is that some races are inherently inferior. So the ideas that are promoted by some speakers that some people are inherently inferior by race, which is a distinction that every freshman that I teach has to make. There's a difference in Heather's argumentation right now that she made between difference versus unequal treatment before the law and society, okay? People can be different. You're saying women and men are different, of course. That doesn't mean they should not be given the same opportunities. So the equality before the law is something separate from difference. Difference can be acknowledged and has to be acknowledged. Of course, there's difference everywhere, but that shouldn't lead to unequal treatment. So when someone comes to the university and his or her known 
recorded point of view is that some races are inherently inferior, or some people by group belonging, handicapped people, Muslims, uh, gay people, women, etc., are not qualified to do certain kinds of work in the university. Women shouldn't really take high-level science courses, things like that. Then is it worth entertaining this idea? Debating it again, putting it to rest once and for all, just because we really want to just examine it one more time. And in the university, many such ideas could be surfaced all the time, but they're not, because we just don't have the time and we don't have the will to do this. So if you come up with an, a great idea from the field of astrology, you're just not invited to the astronomy department, just ruled out. No one sues on First Amendment grounds for that. I can give you a list of examples of what these are. Racial equality before the law. This country settled that. We don't negotiate that again. The law of gravity, settled. Harry Potter is a wizard. Oh no, that's not settled, we don't know. Slavery is bad. Planet Vulcan does not exist. It used to be believed in science it existed. It was settled in science. Paradigm is there. You don't come back and say, I have a great theory. We discovered Planet Vulcan last night. You don't come to the astronomy department. Women are not inherently inferior. Different, yes. Inferior, no. Homosexuality is not a disease. Smoking nicotine is healthful. Certain things we don't negotiate again. And this is where I'm going to close. So Heather said there's a larger problem in place. I agree with her. I think the larger problem is actually that what is at stake is the role of the university, along with the media and science, as the arbiters of truth in society. I think the free speech debates, the campus controversies, are setups to force the university to accept points of view that are really not acceptable in serious academic discourse. I think the question for me is not as much as Heather's describing that there's a kind of ideology of victimology being sold to people who otherwise would be completely unaware that there is such a thing as inequality in this country and they've been indoctrinated to believe that actually the where, the where they are and all the numbers that bear out that actually statistically it is still more difficult for certain groups to attain certain kind of professional uh, levels of, at of attainment, that all of this is just indoctrination, ideology, not fact-based. This is Heather's worry what's happening to the university. My worry is a little bit somewhere else and I'm thinking I'm a little bit more worried that there's such willingness to say the university must not and cannot decide what ideas are settled and no longer deserve to be debated and do not need an invitation at $500,000 an invitation. So it doesn't need to spend millions every year to rehash junk science that some race is inherently inferior, which also collides with another principle. And I know I'm going to run into trouble with the lawyers in the room because it runs into trouble with the other principle that the equality of participation is a legally mandated requirement for educational institutions. So Title IX gives us a legal obligation to say, in this room I cannot say, I want all the women to leave because I don't think women are really capable of kind of philosophical thought. That is not legal. It's also not in the interest of the university because the university is interested in having the best ideas put forward and not the ideas only by some group. So I want to make this argument that certain ideas fall in the category of junk science, settled ideas, and conflict with the equality, of, equality principle. Lastly, I want to say that I think it is quite important to listen to the students, and I'll, clo I'll close with two philosophers who I find are quite useful. So Simone Weil, in the 1940s, French philosopher, was charged to write a charter for the French nation after Nazi occupation. How could France recover its democratic civil structure? And she said, the worst thing to do when someone complains who you are supposed to govern or who are you supposed to administer to is to dismiss them because they're not articulating their grievance in the right way. The arrogance of a magistrate who exercises his eloquence in, in the face of people who are not quite expressing themselves. He said, she said it is the most inhumane thing to witness. And Marcus Aurelius said, when people protest, so let's say the Black Lives Matter protest that Heather invoked in 2015, when people protest, they're usually saying something is wrong and the governor should listen and they shouldn't dismiss the protest out of hand. And so I'm saying a little more room. It would have been, I think, important for this conference to include the voices of students who actually don't just fall in sort of one category. And to close, um, so the regulation of speech in the university is in the interest of the university. It is not opposed to free speech. It is not an abridgment of the First Amendment, but it's actually to allow for education to take place. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
So what I would, I would encourage members of the audience who have questions to step to the podium. Um, and perhaps so while that line forms, and we may take multiple questions at once. Um, in fact, I think I have some questions, but why don't we turn it over? And would you mind if we, uh, I think it would be wise since we have a little shortened time, if we could have several people ask questions, perhaps two or three, and then the uh, panelists can respond. No? Oh, I thought, I thought Paul was telling me no. Okay. So if you will, um, go ahead. Uh, uh, so first, I want to thank you guys for coming, but uh, I also wanted to take issue with the narrative that victimology is solely carried by these young minority students. And I say this as a Hispanic student. Um, I believe that this victimhood is often thrust upon us, as uh, Ms. McDonald uh, alluded to earlier. Uh, and this, I think, comes from a privileged group of elites that presume that we are incapable of, you know, advocating for ourselves and acting on our own behalf. Uh, and these things like the coddling forces in our university and affirmative action are demeaning to people like me because they make the assumption that without the help of university administrators, I cannot get into any program on my own accord. So to say that uh, it's the students that are entirely the, uh, the res ones responsible for uh, this victimhood uh, and this overly emotional reaction to everything, I think ignores uh, the cause of it and who is thrusting it upon us. If you uh, read Jonathan Haidt's uh, uh, article uh, called The Fragile Generation that was published near the end of last year. It talks a lot about uh, parents from, you know, uh, parents raising the millennial generation and not giving them any sort of freedom to do anything and creating this, uh, this society where people have not learned how to deal with conflict, have not learned how to deal with their uh, feelings being hurt in any way. And I think that that is, uh, area that should be studied uh, more and an area that should be addressed more in, uh, in uh, places like this. Thank you very much. Can we have another question perhaps if that's, uh, would the panelists prefer that format so you can respond? Otherwise, we may not get to many of the questions. First of all, thank you for speaking up as a student. Yeah. Really fantastic yes. and I absolutely agree. Yes, and you should have the right to say, this is my story and I, I want to actually not be framed in particular ways. And I think it's right to draw attention to I think Heather's actually participating in this to sort of say, you know, in some ways saying two things at once. There's a victim story out here and I'm one of those victims, so. I have never, I don't know where I've ever said that I'm a victim. I have never okay. complained about victimhood. Uh, I didn't even talk about my experience today and I've not done so much. That is, that is false. I would certainly agree with you that there is a massive bureaucracy that is itself committed to this narrative of victimhood. There is a codependency between the diversity bureaucracy and students that are all too happy to uh, engage in, in this model and self-pity. Uh, of course, there may be uh, grounds for complaint somewhere in society. I would insist, however, that students at Princeton who think of themselves uh, in self-pitying ways are, are simply out of touch with a real appreciation for the world. To be at Princeton is to enjoy resources that kings in the age of absolutism would have killed for. You have everything at your fingertips. You have made it. Uh, so that, that is a voice that, again, it's not, it's not necessarily originating with the students. Uh, it is absolutely the, the faculty and the, and the bureaucracy is complicitous. Um, and, and I think our focus <clears throat> does have to be on the faculty and the bureaucracy that has a, a stake in making sure that students continue to think of themselves. I disagree with Haight and Lukianov to a certain extent, though, in that I don't agree with the psychological explanation for the victim ideology. I don't think it's the snowflake helicopter parenting because you don't see a whole lot of white males playing the victim card, but they've got the same parents. I think what we're seeing is an ideological phenomenon, 
not a psychological one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. Good morning. Two questions, actually. I think that my first question will follow up on what you were saying, Heather. Do you think that um, the state of affairs that we're in now is because we lack a sufficient contrast with totalitarian regimes? So, Professor Baer, you had mentioned earlier the University of Virginia example. However, World War II, the Nazi Germany experience, the Soviet experience fresh on everybody's mind. Do you think that the absence of a contrasting totalitarian regime has diminished the importance of the First Amendment. And my second question is, to what extent do you think that the exercise of power, whether that be political power or something else, is motivating students and others who may be influencing students on college campuses, the power to demand um, concessions from university administrators, the power to have somebody terminated for really no reason, um, but then that becomes a trophy for those people. Thank you. Two questions. Go ahead. Um, so, uh, I would like to I would like to answer your second question. I believe that we are misunderstanding what these protests are for a couple of reasons. One, these protest movements are always composed of two factions. One of these factions, I think, is aware of the distinction. The other isn't. There are those that really wish to end oppression permanently. That's what they earnestly desire. And there is another that wishes to turn the tables of oppression. Now, that turn the tables part of the movement is actually in control of the strategy. And others are going along with it in the false belief that at the point that some sort of state of equity is reached, that there will be a truce called, which is not the reality of the situation. Um, the problem is that this falseness to the collective movement is actually blocking the real complaint. People in general have a sense. If you are um, in a particular population, you can detect that there are ways in which civilization is actually structurally stacked against you. It is very hard to understand in detail what is going on and how it functions. And so the, the narrative that is being advanced about what's taken place in civilization and why it's unfair is uh, false. And so it is tempting to dismiss it completely. But what we're really, I mean, the irony of the whole situation, and there, there are many of them, but maybe the greatest irony is that in order to advance this agenda, they are challenging science. They are trying to, to um, eliminate the one tool that might allow you to actually figure out what the subtle details are um, that are actually structuring the system so certain people have advantages that other people can't access. And so in, in, in unhooking science, and in response to Ulrich, I have to say, uh, Alison Stanger and myself and Alice Drager and Laura Kipnis and all of these examples of people who have found themselves cast out in some particular way. That's the wrong place to focus. For every one of me, there are 10,000 faculty members that aren't saying anything because they now know what happens if you do, right? That's the whole reason to do to me what was done to me is so that other people will get the message, you don't want to say those things or it will happen to you. So don't focus on me, I'll be fine. Focus on what the chilling effect of these movements is and the fact that what their actual objective is is not in their interest. If you really want to address the inequities in society, you need to understand them, which means you need those scientific tools. You need, for example, to understand why sexism and racism are actually evolutionarily very different. No, Brett, I, t I agree, and I actually thank you for saying that. I, and I think what Heather is saying as well, I actually thank you also for saying this victim ideology goes too far in a certain way. I just think you take it so far to say there is no experience that you can validate as long as soon as you see the label Princeton. I said, why would you not acknowledge that even at Princeton things could become better? I mean, <laughs> they just could become better. And for some reason, for you to say every student there has no, you're kind of saying they have no right to speak because they have it so good. Of course they have it really good, but that doesn't mean it's good enough. As we've seen, things can be improved. So I just think actually I have more hope that these conversations can advance universities rather than shutting down this saying everything is already good enough. And in some ways it sounds to me you're saying let's not, so I actually think what Brett's saying 
let's really pay attention to this, the chilling effect that people could not speak up is bad. I think that we have a conference like this and a panel like this that people should be able to articulate their great concerns that you cannot say certain things. So I would welcome you, Heather, on campus to say, I want to talk about that this victim ideology doesn't allow people to really talk about their experiences. I think that is actually what we're trying to remove is those, not just the legal, but the internal kind of moral barriers. And about power, two things have happened. The university has become a much more of a corporate entity with much higher prices, with much greater numbers. It is much more driven by a consumer mentality in the last, let's say, 40 years. And secondly, what also happened, there's a kind of moral authority attached to personal experience in Black Lives Matter, in the hashtag MeToo movement, and people speaking on behalf of an experience because they felt the due process, that process didn't work for them to be heard. So that's a different kind of power, right? So there's financial, economic power, and then there's moral power or moral authority. I would just respond, uh, Professor Baer, you twice said that, well, of course, differences can be acknowledged, referring to differences between the sexes. No, you, they cannot be acknowledged. That is exactly what we've seen at Google, uh, which is that somebody is now fired for suggesting that there are biological differences between the sexes. On average, on average, that does not say anything. You cannot make any conclusions about an individual based on the distribution of traits. And you now have, a, a, evidence that the government bureaucracy is starting to view that the same response, that to say that is now viewed as a fireable offense. This is very, very worrisome. We are moving very close or, or in the direction of a true uh, political censorship of what can be said in the realm of science. This should worry all of us. Part of the question had to do with a foil of totalitarianism, which perhaps you've addressed a little bit right there, but... Um, yeah, I find it amazing. I mean, the Charlottesville was a game changer. The, the killing somebody is a, the, the most abominable violation of a civil polity. That, that, is, that, that took what's the, the civil violence to a new level. Nevertheless, that having been said, the idea that the Antifa movement calls itself anti-fascist is amazing. They're the ones that on a regular basis, again, Charlottesville is in a category by itself and I am not equating them. Please do not mistake me. But nevertheless, it is the black bloc that is regularly breaking windows, pummeling uh, perceived opponents, trying to silence speech the, and, and with the applause of the professors at UC Berkeley. Uh, so the idea that that is, that they get to adopt for themselves the anti-fascist moniker, I find very bizarre. Now we are obviously, uh, you know, I'm not gonna get modern, we are very far from being Nazi Germany. Uh, but, but these are tactics that should be called out much, much more and more vociferously than they are. They they're somehow get a pass uh, because they're done in the, in the name of, of sort of a le leftist ideology. It is just amazing to me. Thank you. Do we have another student perhaps who might ask no, a question? No, 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 no. Okay. Um, so yes, yesterday it was brought up the notion that we can't trust the academia because of bias within the professorate. And now today it's been brought up the notion that, we, that, we, that the public is now ignoring the academia because of conflicting matters of public opinion versus scientific truth, as you, truth, as you mentioned with uh, you know, the case of gender differences, the, where the public is ignoring what the academia has concluded because it does not fit the egalitarian model that broader society wants to believe. Um, so... Uh, where are we? That, uh, to me, I think this is a sign of our kind of gradual descent into madness in which our society is gradually descending into because of the uh, domination of emotional rhetoric. Not to say that emotional rhetoric is bad inherently, but the level which we are seeing it within our society is starting to reach, I believe, pinnacle levels of negative uh, effects. 
So given the ever more present use of grievance culture at universities, which are supposed to be the beating heart of Western society's logic and intellectualism, how do you think you, we can repair the damage and restore the value of logos to our universities with regards to administration, faculty, as well as the students, and in turn, how might we then repair broader society so that way we can not only mend the divide within universities, but then mend the divide between universities and the public? Thank you. Who would like to address that? Um, we're going to have to start thinking game theoretically. If there's one thing that most of us didn't study that we should have, it's game theory. And uh, <laughs> I don't understand why, in a world in which colleges and universities are in fierce competition for students, we are not seeing a fair number of institutions um, standing against this trend as a feature. Right? If, if I was about to send my kids to college, and I'm not there yet, but if I was about to send my kids to college, I would be looking at whatever tiny subset of colleges had a policy that forbid this kind of nonsense and protected their sciences um, from attack. What happened at Evergreen wasn't a failure within the sciences, it was that another part of the college rebelled against the sciences and it came after us. And so any, any college that can figure out how to forbid that has a competitive advantage and students that graduate from that college will have a competitive advantage. So why are we not seeing a race to the top where colleges are falling all over themselves in order to announce their excellent policy on dealing with these kinds of protest movements? And that is not to say shutting down complaint, but if the complaint is to be leveled, it needs to be coherent. We need to understand what the complaint is about. And unfortunately, colleges and universities are being targeted not because they are bastions of white supremacy and sexism, but because they are soft targets, because they are listening, precisely because they are liberal. Okay? It's a place you can level the complaint and not get beaten. So that's why we're seeing it there, which renders the complaint incoherent. As Heather is pointing out, it's very bizarre to see students at Princeton protesting about what they face because obviously they're at Princeton. On the other hand, what they are failing to articulate is that there is a problem, that populations are competing with each other in unfair ways. They can't say it in a way that makes sense, and so they're saying something that doesn't make sense, which makes them all too easy to dismiss. So anyway, the answer is colleges. A difference. I do not experience universities and colleges the way you do, actually. I do not think there's a conspiracy. I do not think I would recommend policies. I think this afternoon's panel, I look forward to legislative remedies, maybe a solution. But I think that actually is not the idea. And to say, I want to go to a, send my son to a college where there's really strict regulation flies in the face of everything that was discussed yesterday. We don't want to regulate that strictly. And I thought it should be left to experts. And you're saying, in a way, that the experts no longer have the upper hand, but now it's ideologues who just say, this is wrong science, this is right science. So I, but I just want to register that I do not recognize the American university in these descriptions. I think, there's a, I think you're painting a picture of this kind of stark um, sort of situation where the institution and its truth-seeking functions are under siege by ideologues who peddle in victimhood. And I, I, don't, I haven't experienced it. I've been at major American universities for a long time, so I'm just a bit puzzled what the real evidence is. And I actually t teach students all the time and deal with students, and I also think they are, they are quite articulate in what they're saying, and they're not all incoherent and spoiled to say uh, they're at NYU, which is not Princeton, so maybe they have more grounds to complain. But I actually listen to them, and I say, well, you're not at Princeton, so I got to acknowledge I got to get to come to Princeton, really. And I, but at Princeton, you're not at Yale, so you have a little bit of grounds to come. So, and I actually think you, you are saying something, it is my job to listen and not to dismiss you out of hand because you got, it to, got to into NYU, or Princeton, or Harvard, or Yale, or any other co college or state university in this country. In some ways to say you're here, therefore you sh we shouldn't listen to you seems odd to me. Um, and maybe I'm too much in the kind of consumer mentality also that the students are clients of the university and I should um, actually make the university work for them. So I'm, I'm sorry to say, um, oh, Heather, I'm so, so Paul, can we have one more, just one final comment? Sure. Yes, yes, okay. Because we're at, we're at 10, 15. Jeremy Go ahead, Heather. Just heckle. Go ahead. I just don't think <laughs> Professor Brent Winston was saying we, we would regulate. I think he's saying we don't want to regulate. I thought you're the one that's saying we should regulate speech, that there's certain no, speech no, that is that. hates. Well, you've written that, at least, that it's, it's, a, it's a possible to say that certain speech is so destructive that it should be. We have a right or to censor it. it's obsolete. I said it. this, yes. It's obsolete science, and it doesn't need to be rediscussed, right? Well, I'm, I'm sorry we've run out of time. I'm sorry to but those can we who... we just hear the three comments or four? Really in one yeah. Paul, do we have time for that? Okay. 30 seconds each. 
So this is just for Ulrich, but it raises the question that Heather just put to him. I thought that there was a disconnect between the account of the neo-Nazis coming onto the University of Virginia campus with mm -hmm. the torches and the anti-Semitic slogans and what you said in the bulk of your um, presentation, which was about certain things no longer need to be relitigated, re need to be redebated. Neo-Nazis weren't coming onto the Virginia campus to begin a great debate about anti-Semitism. They were there to sow fear and they were there to sow hatred. And so the thing that seems to be missing from your account of negotiating controversial speakers on campus was the issue of hate speech. And I had sworn to myself that I wouldn't talk about hate speech at this conference, but the notion of hate speech not as expressive of hatred, but as deliberately attempting to foment, stir up, elicit, and incite hatred in a community that depends on certain amounts of trust. And I thought that was lacking. I'm not saying that uh, uh, hate speech laws are, are, are the best thing. I think there's a genuine debate to be had, and I have tried to contribute rationally to it. But the notion that campus authorities should be indifferent or even welcome attempts to stir up hatred among different sectors of the university, uh, uh, they should welcome that intention and that aim seems to me to be um, uh, inappropriate. We need to think about the hate speech dimension as well as the redundancy of debate dimension. I, Thank I you. hesitated to bring that up. As, uh, yeah. Let's just get a series of questions. So about. I just wanted to ask a hypothetical for Professor Bear because it was interesting, speaking of slippage, it seemed from the Nazi example, we went down to a large range of things that it sounds like you would say would be out of bounds for the university, some of which are believed by billions of people perhaps completely wrongly, but there it is, so there is this debate. So what I want to ask you is how you would deal with the following. A student group, maybe a militant atheist group, uh, that may even say we hate religion in various ways, say, you know, we particularly believe that conservative Islam is a very dangerous belief system. Uh, and in the tradition of centuries of debate about whether some religions are very dangerous, we want to ar articulate that, and one of the reasons we think it's particularly bad is it uh, has very bad views towards homosexuality, which we think is perfectly normal. And, uh, um, and But because we're genuinely committed to debate, we will, in fact, perhaps because we will show the public better uh, our position, we will invite a, a conservative Muslim religious leader who will say, no, 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 we are right because homosexuality is a mental illness and it's an abomination harshly condemned by God. And I can't defend my position, he would say, unless I do that. So would your view be that both sides should actually be excluded from campus because uh, well, uh, one denies equality based on religion, which you might argue is a constitutional value, and the other is denies science or what you might think is settled morality because there's also a moral component, not just scientific. Would you say that one side should be free to put on its side of the debate and the other side should not because it's too hateful or because uh, it sort of denies what we now know for, for the last 45 years since 1974 is now settled science? Uh, uh, and if so, which side do you think should be the one that it's excluded? Thank you. We have two more, and if you could just make it as short as and to the point as possible, it would be appreciated. Okay, so I'm Matthew Foldy, and I'm a fourth year at University of Chicago, which is relevant because our policies are great, and we actually had more people subscribe to become first years this year. We had to kick students into off-campus housing who had already signed up. So if anyone has questions about UChicago, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. But my question is just, Simply, and I think it's relevant, how do you define controversial? Because I think controversial is now anything, whether you would sort of think it's controversial or not, that one person has expressed opposition to. And then because, it's like, because it is then deemed controversial, it is then problematic. So I'm curious how you would define the word controversial, because I, I don't think it's sort of as dictionary-based definition as you would normally think or hope it would be. Thank you. So everything's been said, but not everybody said it. Uh, <laughs> Daniel Cullen, Rhodes College. Uh, Ulrich, this, this is for you as, as well. Uh, I, I remember Bernard Williams in his famous essay on the idea of equality said there's this curious thing about racists. They, they somehow feel the obligation to have a, a theory, to have some idea that, that backs up their hateful emotion. And so they actually submit themselves to the discipline of, of reason in an, in an odd way. And that's really their vulnerability. And so the idea that 
you could expose the argument. You know, Jews will not replace us is not a proposition, but what about the, the point that just exposing the, the weakness, the stupidity, the imbecility of the, of the argument is the most effective way to defeat it? But, that, but you, you relied on this, on this faith that the professional norms of the, uh, of the academy will filter out the, the junk science. I, I don't share that, that confidence, but I wonder if you take that position, wouldn't you also have to exclude as a, as a junk claim the statement by the student protesters at, at Middlebury after the, after the fact that the appearance of Charles Murray amounted to an existential threat to, the, to, the, to every marginalized minority at, at Middlebury? Is that not a junk claim that doesn't belong in a serious educational environment? Paul, do we have uh, time for just quick just, responses? Yeah. Yeah, quick thoughts from each of the quick panel. Thoughts. Is that is that okay? Sure. Okay, great. So starting with you, Ulrich, and if you could keep Eugene it as Eugene seems to have answered his own question, so I'll just give it back to you. Uh, yes, I would allow your second hypothetical and not the first one. Uh, to the other question about the uh, the middle bear. Well, you will, let's rehearse it afterwards. It's a little complicated otherwise. And uh, the, the last question about the Middlebury's, no, I actually think different claims, not junk science. In some ways, the students are saying something else. They're not saying, I'm proving scientifically that the presence of this person is a threat to me. In some ways, these are different categories. And I think when you're bringing up Bernard Williams, we have to come up with categories. Secondly, Bernard Williams, with all due respect, no, I do not believe that most races come with arguments, <laughs> actually. And what Jeremy Waldron said, they don't even come to debate why I had that as an example is because the entire summer preceding Charlottesville, every single publication from the National Review to the, to the Atlantic to the New Republic, everyone said, for the sake of academic freedom and academic debate, we must invite Richard Spencer, which is how he's been suing five universities, on that ground only. And I said, to, you cannot accept that ground. And everyone has fallen in line and said, until Charlottesville, and then the next day people said, People literally, someone said to me, a major editor of a major American national magazine said, I didn't know the Nazis didn't come to debate. And I thought, you run a national magazine, really? Seriously? And he said, your intellectual epiphany is pathetic. They actually really said, we didn't know they're this bad. We didn't know they would kill someone. And then you get to, is it immediate incitement to violence? But I didn't use that argument of hate speech to actually address the original justification, which I think is faulty to say in the name of academic open debate, we must invite a neo-Nazi, because that's only our tax But I think you're right, hate speech is the other term that's probably been missing. So you know, you can heckle the, all of the afternoon and bring that point up then, thank you. Well, I, I think the Middlebury students are uh, delusional, and, and that is a, it's a perfect expression of the logic of shutting down non-conforming speech that grows out of the academic victimology. For them to say that they are at threat or at existential threat from Charles Murray is, I, I'm sorry, I, I am actually a relativist, believe it or not. I, I have enough of a deconstruction uh, background in me that I don't believe in truth, but I am willing to say that they are wrong. Charles Murray is not an existential threat to them. Uh, and that that kind of belief uh, is what is cultivated by the diversity bureaucracy. To the student's question about who defines controversial, um, let's note that it is becoming whatever students say it is. Uh, Professor Baer suggested that the free speech debates are kind of a setup, that they're you know, throwing out the Richard Spencers in order to, to get a provocation, uh, to, you know, to rile up the students in it, so then we can all say, oh, these, these crazy left-wing uh, academies. Let's note some of the people that have been the targets of shutdowns and disinvitations. Condi Rice, Christine Lagarde, Madeleine Albright, NYPD Commissioner Ray Kelly, uh, black New York uh, Wall Street Journal columnist Jason Riley. These are not Richard Spencers. Uh, the, the ambit of what, what is now viewed as hate speech that is putting the, the actual existence of females and minorities at risk is becoming very, very wide. Uh, and and it, again, it is growing out of an academic victimology, and that is where we have to uh, address this problem if we're going to address it at all. 
Brett, we have about one minute until the next panel. Okay. So, it, okay. but I do want to give you an opportunity to say some All final right. words. Um, Charles Murray is a great example. He is not a threat to the students of Middlebury. However, were Charles Murray right about what he is saying, it suggests a very serious problem in civilization that is going to require some very careful thinking to deal with. So I believe there's no reason for violence, there is no reason to shut him down, but that they are actually reacting to a threat that is not to the students of Middlebury, but to populations in a, uh, a, a um, diverse society. I would also say be very careful with the idea of hate speech or that something is controversial. Once you have been in my shoes, you've been accused of being a Nazi, of being in the alt-right, you realize what these things are. They are weaponized terms designed to get other people not to be able to hear what you are saying. You've heard me. You know I'm not a Nazi. But that is something that has been hurled at me. Why? Not because the people who are hurling it believe it, but because it keeps other people from listening. Right? So if you define these categories, you are creating that problem. Well, I want to thank our panelists for an incredibly thought-provoking set of presentations and responses to questions. I, because I'm an administrator at ASU, I just and we had a plug about the University of Chicago. I want to say a word about ASU. Um, I think you know we have. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to say a couple points. One is that you know we have more than 40 percent minority students here at ASU, 13,000 international students. We have the highest fire rating that's offered by that organization. And we had the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership, which was created to en enhance and, and promote these kind of conversations. So I just have to make that plug for ASU. I want to thank Paul for a wonderful conference and for the opportunity for our, all of our speakers to be here and such a terrific audience and, and participants. So thank you very much, everybody.